Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the afternoon session. My name is Karen Dopkins. I'm a professor of psychology across the street at UC San Diego. And I was trained as a visual neuroscientist here at the Saul Institute with Tom Albright as my thesis advisor. And I've been involved with ANFA for the few, last few years. So as wave introductory for this session today, um, which is about the interaction between the visual sense and architecture, I want to say that maybe it's oversimplifying things, but the goal of an architect or an interior designer is to invoke a certain sensation or mood in the viewer. Um, and if you talk to an architect, they will pretty much tell you that that is their goal. And they will often also tell you that it, they usually use their own experience and their own intuition to evoke that sense in their viewer. And it makes sense that they would use their own experience for this because it's quite likely that their experience is quite similar to the, sim to the experience of their client. Um, now, where psychology and neuroscience comes in is testing these ideas. And I mean, architects obviously are not obligated to test that their buildings do in fact provoke a certain sensation or experience in, in their clients. Nobody asks them to prove it. But again, where the psychologists and neuroscientists come in is to start to test things systematically. Um, and psychologists, as you know, work with people. And in the context of the theme of this session, a psychologist might work with people in her laboratory and show that uh, subject a stimulus and say, do you like the stimulus, yes or no, on a scale of one to seven? Or tell me the, the, show me the color that makes you feel most tranquil, or show me the color that makes you feel most engaged. And as psychologists, we collect those data and we quantify them and we characterize them and we can make some summary statements. So for example, you've already heard yesterday, um, there was, there's been several studies showing that when you ask people in a psychological study, do you prefer curved or straight lines, they tend to prefer the curved lines. Um, you might also know that there's a large literature on color preferences and which colors evoke certain moods. So it turns out that the colors blue and green tend to evoke a sense of tranquility and the colors reds and orange evoke a sense of engagement. Um, one of the other things that the psychological data provide to us, and we're gonna, we talked about this a little bit today, and we're going to come back to it tomorrow on our session on special needs, is the psychologist can help us understand how certain, um, how different uh, people are affected by certain visual experiences. And by different people, I mean older people, younger people, people with special needs like autism or ADHD. Again, we're going to talk about this tomorrow. Um, this is something that my lab particularly focuses on, um, the developmental years, and we focus on kids with autism. The neural data um, that you've also heard about in the last couple of days are also very important. People collect EEG data, fMRI data, galvanic skin response data, um, heart rate variability, all of which in my mind are a way to kind of go directly to the source and ask the body, you know, what is your experience body? And a lot of the times I think that the, um, the biological data are very similar to the psychological data. In other words, if you ask somebody, do you like this stimulus, and they say yes, their galvanic skin response, their EEG, their heart rate variability will all sort of corroborate what they're actually telling you. But I think it's interesting, and I don't know if this will come up in some session, to think about the idea that there may sometimes be a dissociation between what a person says, says they experience versus what their body is doing. And I think that Dr. Patti's talk yesterday kind of suggested that there may be cases where the amygdala is telling you one thing, the amygdala being this very subconscious system that's so like animalistic, telling you that there's something to be fearful of, despite the fact that his subjects didn't seem to always be saying that they were experiencing fear. So I think it's a fun idea that architects could play with the dissociation between what the body response is and what the conscious mind is doing. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, let me just introduce the speakers today who are going to be talking about these topics. We're starting off with Audrey Lustig-Michael, and she's going to be talking about how certain visual scenes tend to tie things together to give a sense of cohesion, and how certain visual scenes can pr promote a sense of focused attention versus unfocused attention. And you might think that is interesting because maybe an engineer needs to be in an environment that provokes very focused thinking, whereas a, an artist needs to be in an environment that provokes more sort of unfocused creative thinking. Um, the next talk is by Anna Kelasidi, and she's going to talk about similar things with more of an emphasis on how visual illusions can be used to promote a certain sense, um, let's say, of spaciousness. So we know that if you present people with stimuli that are low contrast, 
they get a sense of greater depth and distance. And that's just capitalizing on the fact that when we look at a mountain out in the distance, we see it muted in its contrast simply because we're looking at the mountain through a lot of haze in the atmosphere. And then we're going to end with Michael Pru, who takes a little bit of a different approach. And he's looking at how sort of canonically visual cues, like spatial cognition and how we look around and get a sense of our place in the world, how those visual cues are processed non-visually. So what do I mean by that? How would you study that? Well, you study that non-visual sense by testing people who are congenitally blind or who went blind later in life. OK, so without further ado, I'm going to bring up Audrey Lustig. Um, the title of her talk is The Role of Visual Attention in Architectural Design, and I'm going to turn her on now. <laughs> OK. Hi, everyone. Um, so yes, my name is Audrey Lustig-Michael. Um, I'm a postdoctoral researcher from Northwestern University. And today, I'm going to be talking about uh, a presentation that's actually a collaboration with an architect, Michael Lustig, from Michael Lustig Architects, who also happens to meet my dad. Um, so I'm just going to show you him real quick. He's here on Skype. So. <laughs> Wave, Dad. Yeah? OK. <laughs> so he's going to be hiding in the corner uh, during the presentation. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Sorry, Dad. OK. So um, OK. Uh, I know you guys all just had lunch. So I'm going to try and wake you up a little bit with some more audience participation. And I know you guys are going to be great, because you already did something similar earlier with Colin's talk. So what I'm going to show you is a series of images very quickly. And I just want you to try and pay attention as fast as you can. Here we go. OK, did you get all that? Yes. Yeah, OK. Um, so now I'm going to test your memory for all of those pictures. So if I show you an image that you remember, Please clap your hands, just like before. OK, here we go. OK, so amazingly, you guys did really well. Um, and I, I don't mean that you know, to, to say that you aren't good performers in attention, but um, it's pretty amazing that your visual system can take in all of that information, the colors, the layouts, the different types of uh, details, and um, you remembered uh, pretty well all of those uh, different images. But now I'm going to ask you um, a little bit trickier questions about those images, and we'll see how you guys do. Um, so in that last picture that I just showed you, um, how many of you think that there was a yellow wall in that scene? OK, so maybe 10% of you. Um, here's that picture. And I was very tricky here <laughs> because there is something very yellow in the picture, but it is not a wall. It is a table. And um, what I'm trying to show you here is that these kinds of processes of assigning different features like color to um, specific objects or locations actually takes a little more effort on your part than just remembering the scene as a whole. Um, let's try one more. So in the image of the two towers, the blue towers, how many of you think the smaller tower was on the left? OK, about 10% again. Um, yes, it was, actually. And again, this is pretty amazing because it's a very simple image, only two objects. But um, it was very hard to remember, was that shorter tower on the left or the right? Um, and again, these kinds of um, relational information of knowing which is on the left or the right um, actually takes some effort on your part. So what I hope to um, demonstrate with this demo is that, in some ways, the visual system is um, quite unlimited in that we can extract things like layout and scene gist and categories very, very quickly. So for instance, when you saw this last image, um, you could very quickly notice that it's an enclosed space, maybe a living room. So you can categorize these things very quickly. Um, but then when you try to think about 
things like details or spatial relations. Um, these kinds of uh, information actually take more time and effort, and you actually have to look at specific things to process them. So for instance, to know that the pictures here are along the left wall of the room, or that it's a yellow table, or that there's a wall that separates two rooms. Um, this actually takes um, some focused attention. So um, today what I'm going to be arguing uh, is that architects specifically um, can play a huge role here in helping people overcome limits of the visual system. And we heard earlier about, uh, earlier about people with very specific deficits in um, spatial visual uh, processing, but even normal populations um, actually have some limits in how much they're able to process in a given scene. And um, specifically, we uh, would like to argue that architects can help people overcome these kinds of limits by guiding attention in um, specific ways in the built environment. Um, and I have the picture of the Salk Institute here, um, not just for uh, reasons of, you know, we're actually here, but it actually does illustrate a lot of the principles that I'm going to be talking about. So um, as Karen mentioned, one principle of um, you know, guiding attention that we're going to be talking about is um, cohesion. So understanding lots of different elements of a space and tying them together. Um, and that can happen through repetition of elements or symmetry. I'm also going to be talking about focal points. So here, the ocean is a major focal point and how that can help people overcome um, limits of understanding the organization of a space. And then finally, I will talk a little bit about this idea that we can cue different types of attention, focused or unfocused thinking, um, with cues such as openness or enclosure of a space. OK. So I'm not really presenting any experiments today. It's more of a theoretical overview, trying to tie in um, both architectural design techniques that can help guide attention, and also talking about the neuroscience or cognitive principles that might be associated with each of those design techniques. So I, I kind of have this um, organization where the architectural principles are on the left, and the neuroscience uh, cognitive principles are on the right. Um, and here's my little floor plan of the talk. So first, we're going to talk about this um, design goal of cohesion, and um, specifically talking about design principles of repetition and symmetry um, from the architectural standpoint. And I'll be talking about some um, principles of how the visual system actually allows you to process things like repetition and symmetry. Um, next, I'll be talking about creating mental maps so taking a 3D space and understanding it for more of a 2D overlay. Um, and specifically, I'll be talking about the use of focal points and principal axes in helping people create these mental maps. Um, and then um, neuroscience, cognitive side, I'll be talking about these ideas of visual salience and landmarks that, that help you um, kind of create these uh, focal points and principal axes. And then finally, I will talk a little bit about attention modes, so focused versus unfocused attention, and how um, some cues like openness or enclosure can um, kind of evoke different types of attention. Um, and I will be discussing a little bit about this attentional restoration theory that we've heard about already. Okay, so we'll start with cohesion. Um, so one design principle that architects might use is repetition. Um, here's an example from the Kimball Museum, also designed by Louis Kahn. Um, and as you can see, he uses the repetition of arches throughout the museum um, to kind of tie in different parts of the museum. Um, and this is just a bird's eye view looking over the museum. And again, you can see this repetition of that arch structure throughout the museum. Um, this is a model of the Philbrook Museum, which um, Michael Lustig worked on. Um, and again, you see repetition of arches, um, but not only arches down the loggia, but also smaller arches below where the statues are, and also above in um, the little turrets. So science-wise, um, repetition is actually 
very beneficial for the visual system because of um, this uh, type of attention called feature-based attention. And this was actually first discovered in monkeys. So in this um, experiment, what they did is they recorded um, from cells in a motion area of a monkey. So the monkey was looking at the cross, but attending to the upwards moving dots at B that were overlaid on some other dots moving downwards, that's A. But what they were measuring were the responsive cells to that location C. So the monkey wasn't paying attention to that location, it was attending to the location of B, but they wanted to see if they had the same direction of motion at C, would cells respond to it? And that's exactly what they found. So basically, more neurons responded to this location C when C had the same upwards direction of motion as the B dots that they were tending to on the left. Um, so basically what this means is that not only is the monkey getting this upwards direction motion in one location on the left, it's getting that location, or sorry, that direction of motion all across the visual field, even in places that the monkey's not paying attention to. Um, so what that means for us is that when we attend to one feature and it's repeated throughout space, we kind of get this um, iteration of activity to all of those different elements. And importantly, what this, what this does for us is it allows us to process things simultaneously so we don't have to go from one location to the next. We can get this um, sense of arches um, all at once. And that really helps with cohesion of understanding um, different parts of space that go together. Um, another principle that can help with cohesion is symmetry. Um, there's been a lot of research on the perception of symmetry, but I'm actually gonna be talking more about this um, complex process that symmetry can help us with. And that is with um, comparison. So when things are symmetric or aligned, it becomes much easier to notice similarities and differences um, between different objects or different parts of a space. So in this study here, um, they were trying to teach kids about um, how diagonal braces have, um, are more structurally sound than horizontal braces. And they had these two conditions. The high alignment case, um, the two objects looked very similar. They were symmetric in a lot of ways. Um, and the only difference is that the brace was diagonal or horizontal. And in the low alignment condition, as you can see, the two objects look very different. And the key finding here was that it was much easier for kids to notice the diagonal brace um, in the high alignment case than in the low alignment case as being a key um, element that makes that a structurally sound object. Um, so the idea here is that using alignment can help you compare things um, more quickly. And this is something that can apply to architecture as well. So here I've just highlighted um, the fact that many elements of this um, main building of the Philbrook are also um, spatially aligned. And this allows you to notice things like the windows on the two sides of the building are similar, but it also allows you to pick out things like in the center where the arches are, the three middle arches have windows, whereas the outer ones don't. And this alignment, I think, is, is really key in helping you very quickly understand similarities and differences. Okay, so that's a little bit about cohesion. I'm now gonna talk a little bit about mental maps and the use of focal points and principal axes um, and what that can do for us. Um, so again, I've shown you this picture several times. Um, one thing you'll notice is that we've highlighted this center axis of the Philbrook. And um, I'm just gonna show you now where that perspective leads you if you stand facing the gardens. So this is an actual photo now of you standing in front of the building looking out towards the gardens. And as you can see at the end of the gardens, um, there is this tempietto right here um, that serves as a focal point for the gardens. And um, this is aesthetically pleasing, but we um, would like to argue that focal points can do more for you than just give you an aesthetic experience, that they can actually help you understand the organization of a space. 
So um, here's another example of the Salk Institute. And in this case, um, the ocean serves as the focal point. And again, we have this um, symmetric axis here leading us towards the focal point. And um, what I think is really key here is that these um, elements are guiding your attention in a very specific way towards the ocean. So um, scientifically, there's a lot of modeling work that um, tries to understand why certain areas of a space are more salient than others. So why do we look towards certain regions of space? And um, the basic idea with saliency maps is that the visual system has this kind of um, winner-take-all way of deciding which region of space to look at. And this can happen um, based on more bottom-up properties of the picture. So by bottom-up, I mean things that are inherent to the scene. So for instance, this cloud stands out from the sky. There's a lot of contrast there. So there's um, just naturally a lot of um, salience that is attributed to that region of space. Again, also, there's a, a high contrast along the ocean um, because of this line. So again, in their modeling, they can show that um, attention is drawn to these regions first because of that high contrast. So something similar is probably happening with focal points, either by using symmetry or perspective or color. Um, architects can draw attention to specific points, and this kind of allows your visual system to automatically um, home in on one region of space more easily. Um, so some other ideas about focal points that um, might help with um, understanding the space is that focal points can help you create landmarks. And um, some recent research that's come out of um, the lab that I work in um, suggests that landmarks can actually be more flexible than we think. So it doesn't have to be um, determined by, you know, color or something else that makes you focus on that space. It's actually more tightly linked to where are you currently attending. So in this experiment, they showed participants this ambiguous rectangle. And normally, you can kind of flip the rectangle so that you see this edge as the front or this edge as the front. And you guys can play around with that a little bit. Um, here we've just illustrated um, using bold how you can kind of flexibly um, pick out which part is the front. Um, and in this experiment, what they did is they had participants um, just naturally look at an ambiguous rectangle and press a button whenever they saw the right side as the front of the rectangle and press the left button when they saw, um, or a different button when they saw the other side as the rectangle. And what you're seeing here is just um, a signal, an EG signal, of where their attention is. So what this is showing is that their spatial attention was very tightly linked to their perception of where the front of this object is. Um, and this is really important because it suggests that it doesn't necessarily matter um, what the landmark is or where it is. It suggests that we can kind of flexibly decide okay, this is my current landmark, this is where I'm heading, um, and that we can kind of reorganize where we are in space based on that. Um, on a related note, we also want to argue that principal axes are um, very important for um, also orienting to space. And um, here I'm just showing you a floor plan of the Philbrook Museum. Um, again, here's the symmetric axis and um, this other axis going through the modern wing. Um, and what you can see now from this perspective is that these two axes actually converge on the same focal point, this tempietto in the gardens. And um, the idea here is that by having multiple um, perspectives of the same focal point through these different axes, um, this can help you understand the 2D um, layout of the space. So by standing at this point and looking here, and then standing at this point and looking out at the same focal point, you can better understand where you are relative to other parts of the environment. Okay. Um, how am I doing on time? Yep, okay. I'm gonna skip through <laughs> and just, um, just cause I'm running out of time. Um, Yeah, 
Um, so I'm just going to skip to this enclosure um, openness type of idea. And um, we've kind of gone over this a little bit already, so I'll just give you a quick um, overview. But basically, the idea is that, um, you know, cues like um, having openness can um, maybe stimulate your attention in different ways. So having this um, cue of op being outside but also being indoors at the same time from the buildings um, can actually inspire creative thinking. And that was one design goal for the Salk Institute. Um, so things like courtyards or just having interactive spaces where you can be indoors and outdoors or having that ambiguity um, can actually possibly change the way that you attend to things. Um, so I won't go over attention restoration theory just because we've been over it several times, but the basic idea is that um, being outdoors can restore your attention. Um, and so it might be good to have these um, different open spaces to allow your attention to um, kind of get restored. So just to sum up, um, I would like to argue that um, architects can help people by um, giving them visual cues and guiding their attention in specific ways. Um, I've talked about some principles that might be especially helpful for certain design goals like cohesion and creating mental maps and um, allowing uh, people to be creative. Um, just some future directions, we can get to this later. Um, what are some other design cues that can aid in going between 2D and 3D representations? Um, and also, I think it's important to try to discuss how architects' use of these visual cues can inform our understanding of the visual system as well. So thank you.